Hi, everybody. Oh, it works. So I was told I, I should start at the exact time. So it's time I should start. Uh, thanks to be here for this talk. Um, I'm Nicola Frankel. This is actually my first time at NDC, so I'm very, very happy. I submitted for a couple of years. First time I'm selected. I'm very, very happy. Um, I was a consultant for 17 years. And the, who was at the keynote? I guess everybody was at the keynote. Yeah, Philip was not at the keynote, probably. but um, And actually, it rang a bell because everything that he explained, I felt deep in my skin. And I actually was like, I quit the consulting job, though I liked it. It's because every time I had organizational issues. So most of the time, you had to find like technical solutions because that you're, if you are a tech person, then you are like pushed toward tech solution. But actually, it would have been much easier to change the organization. But organization had the hardest to change, right? So now I work as a developer advocate. It's much easier. If I tell you something, well, you are free to apply it or not. It's your problem now. Um, so your first API, who here? has like created an HTTP or a REST or a RESTful API already. Yeah, OK. So probably you are in the good room. I hope you will learn something. So the first time you do that, actually, um, you are focused on a lot of different issues, that, like the correct modeling or your, of your business, the, the name of the entities. And then you, have not, you, you need to think about the correct semantics, the verbs. Is it, is it a post? Is it a put? Should we implement patch? This is really involved stuff, no? because in general, you, you don't want um, to, to, to redo it afterwards. So you want to stick to it for a long time. So you're focused on that. But then at some point, probably your business or your team lead or somebody will say, hey, we need to deploy version 2. And the fact that your API is easy to migrate or has the capability to like, allow for a very like, nice flow to migration is not something you plan for. So the idea of this talk is that you don't get this kind of like, reaction. So this is your initial situation. You've got an upstream, you've got like some backend service, and you've got endpoints, and people can access the endpoints, and everything works like this, right? And my solution is, hey, please introduce an API getaway. That's the end of the talk. <laughs> no, in general, when I say that, people tell me, hey, like, here, you were very polite. I see that we are in Denmark. Hey, is it the, the truth? Yes. No, in general, that's not the truth. The truth is something like this. This is the truth? And now it's a trap question, and you know. Yeah. No, in general, you have a reverse proxy. And my ID is, hey, sorry, not this one, this one. An API gateway should help. Who knows about the difference between a reverse proxy and an API gateway? Victor, please don't say anything. OK, so I will develop a bit. So I, yeah, you have old speakers here. So I also have gray hair. I started using the internet more than 20 years ago. Some of you I see are not much older than that. Um, and. I used, at the time, I created my own web page. Can you imagine that? So I had no like, computer science education. I created my own web page. I learned everything on the spot. And at the time, HTML, it was only static files. Huh? You, you had like HTML files. You had images like crazy. You had images. Imagine that. Now, for the, the people who came before that time, it was probably a revolution. For me, I started with images. And we had audio files. So the, the good stuff is when you open the page, you could put an audio MIDI file, and it would play. Yeah, it sucked, right? Who did it? Yeah. I can understand that. And no CSS. So uh, to have like buttons like that 
to, to make the buttons to have a bevel effect. We use table with different colors. Who is laughing? You did it, right? I did also. <laughs> and, and imagine that, no JavaScript. That, yeah, that was the life, yeah, no JavaScript. Now we have a lot of JavaScript. And um, oh, since there are some people who are laughing because they did the same mistake, who remember this stuff, like this stuff here? Wow, amazing. Hot Dog Pro? Yeah. So you, you don't see the screenshot, but you remember the name. So Hot Dog Pro was, uh, it, it was not WYSIWYG at all. It was an editor where you could select the tag that you wanted to insert. That was like super, super complex software at the time. And actually, you also had to remember to close the tag. He, he didn't do it. Well, it was fun. So that's funny because I've done this talk a couple of times, and there is always somebody in the room who already know, like, who used Hot Dog Pro. That was fun. Anyway, so the idea at the time is that the web server was actually designed to serve static content. To be honest, at the time, I didn't care that much. I created my HTML files. I used FTP to upload them somewhere. And then I was happy to see the results over the internet. And when I say over the internet, uh, I mean, I like the modem. Beep, boop, huh? Yeah, that was the internet at the time. Actually, that was not my case because I was using it at my university. When people outside wanted to check my web page, they, they had to do this. But the idea still stands. That was very simple. Serve static content. And then, because, well, we are engineers, we are developers, somebody decided it's not enough. Probably we want to have something more. We want to insert something dynamic. We want to have the time. Completely useless, right? But we want to have the time. Yeah, yeah. Who did it? Yeah. The, I mean, the term like user experience didn't appear until much, much later. So it was more about, hey, it's fun, let's do it. So the idea that at the time you had like CGI scripts to generate your web page. But yeah, written in Perl. The thing is, it was not a great idea because you actually had to learn Perl and you had to learn like HTML. And it was hard to update, hard to maintain, not such a great idea. So somebody came up with a good idea, like let's have the same HTML stuff, add like one tag, one opening tag, one ending tag, and then the parser will actually read the HTML and just render like in between tags. And it was the beginning of PHP, which began as an Apache module inside the Apache web server. And PHP stands for? PHP Thanks. And who said something else? Some yeah, so here you see that like the generation gap. The young person here says it's hypertext preprocessor, looks very serious. The old guy here knows that it stood as personal homepage, and they decided to change it because it didn't look that great for like a professional technology. <laughs> I'm not kidding, yeah? you can look. And we started to use this stuff over and over again, and it was really, really the rise. And companies started to use it as their official communication channel, which means that, well, you had to like bake in some reliability in it. Because if you have a web server and people want to access your communication channel to see your latest promos or your whatever, then if it's down, it's not a good advertisement. So the idea is that we had the web server layer like to serve the web content, and then we, we added another layer on top or on bottom, it depends how you see it, to actually like add reliability, add resiliency, to do some load balancing. And now we see that we added one more capability to the web server. So, and afterwards, well, you're like, you probably were born in that area, like the web was everywhere. Um, and now we, we 
add even more capabilities because before, all the nodes, they were the same. They, they served the same content. But now we already add one single entering point to add the load balancer and the routing, um, sorry, to add the load balancer. And now we, we, we want to have like different nodes that serve different contents. And then we need to add routing to, to the capabilities. And so that's actually the evolution of the web server. First, we served static contents, then we served dynamic contents, then we added load balancing, and now we add routing. And it's easy because we are engineers. We see a single entry point and say, oh, like, this is like a cross content concern. We can put more stuff here. So we put more stuff every time. Like authentication. Why should the application care about authentication? It's a cross cutting concern. Or authorization, or caching, or IP blocking, or whatever. So we remove all those like, features from our web application probably they didn't have them, well, like IP blocking and caching, they didn't have them in the first place. But we remove as much as possible and we put e everything on the like web server, which doesn't serve anything. But it's still a web server anyhow. And now, because the web is everywhere, it's not only about human to human, it's about machine to machine. And the first integration way that we did was Hey, you create a file, you put it in the FTP folder. There is a batch job on the other side that reads the content of the folder. It reads probably the content of the file, like gets the data. And when the job has finished, it renames the file. Old people who did that? Yeah. Who is still doing that? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. And well, it works, it's reliable, but of course, it depends on the job frequency, meaning that if you want to have like real-time data, it doesn't work that well. So of course, every stack like .NET, Java, Ruby, Python have their own ways of communicating, but you probably want to interact with interregional systems. And like the lowest common denominator in that case is our old friend HTTP. And for that, you have an API gateway. Because when you start to integrate stuff with HTTP, then you have new concerns. And those concerns, they could be actually addressed by a reverse proxy. For example, you have an API gateway, and you decide that, well, probably you will bill uh, clients of your API depending on their usage, or perhaps they have like, I don't know, they subscribe to some like fixed price and then they have a limit or, of like 1,000 calls per hour or per day, whatever. You can bake that in, in a regular reverse proxy. You use Nginx, you write your C module. Who is a C developer? Nobody. Oh, well, I'm relieved, but there is always one or two, but that's good. Who is a Java developer, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, I know, but I, I, I just dot net con dot net C sharp. Okay. Ruby. Python. Yeah, I see that. Like C sharp. Yes, uh, Python. Not that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a dot net conference. That's fine. My, my, my demo will be, will you, you won't see much of Java code anyway. Um, so the idea is that you can back that in, into your uh, reverse proxy. You can write your own Nginx module. It's an open source project. That means that you will need to compile it and compile it with the server probably, which means that if you want to change the business logic, because your business has such an idea that, hey, let's create another pricing for whatever reason then you will need to bring your server down and like bring it up again after compiling, which is not super great. You want the pricing to be like easily changeable and, and you, you want to, uh, not to have zero downtime. You can also have like complex rate limiting. Again, for the same reason, you might want that people who are not registered 
they get certain number of calls and people register, they have another limit or perhaps they have no limit at all. Again, you can do that, just create the code, but it's not as great. So the idea of the API Gateway is just like the reverse proxy added features after features, the, the, the API Gateway adds features that are related to APIs, such as like billing and complex threat limit. There are a couple of API gateways on the market. Victor, it's, it's your time to shine. Look. No, it's your time. Look. Your friend is here. <laughs> um, so I work on the Apache API 6 project. Victor works on the Kong gateway project. You've got others. They are also like cloud provider based one. I don't cite them because I'm, I mean, I've known about Windows on the desktop in the like 2000s, and I don't want to use any cloud provider that locks me in, but of course, your mileage may vary. About Apache API 6, it's an Apache project, so top level. Uh, who knows about Apache API 6, by the way? One person? Two persons? Yeah, obviously. OK, great. Um, I won't talk about it much. I would just use it for the demo, but I mean, that's not an advertisement, though I work for the project. Um, the architecture is actually pretty, pretty similar to uh, all others. So we have, oh, sorry, here, it's here. Yes, we have uh, Nginx at the bottom, like open source version, open Resty, which is a Lua engine, meaning you need to write Lua for most of the plugins, though you can, we can accept an, uh, like a couple of other languages. Then you've got a couple of uh, out-of-the-box plugins. And so, now that I hope that I explained why an API gateway is different from a reverse proxy, and now that probably you have a reverse proxy in front, you will change to an API gateway, the first step is to introduce the API gateway. So let's do the demo. I will be very happy if you have questions in the meanwhile, because, well, you know, lockdown and stuff, all remote is not fun, whereas here we can have some degree of interaction. I understand that interaction are very uh, specific to the country. I know that countries on the north, well, interaction, probably not that, but it's fine. I mean, everything is fine. So here I created my architecture. I'm using uh, Docker Compose because it's easier. Of course, you probably shouldn't run in production. But anyway, I have the Apache API 6 image. Uh, API 6 uh, stores its configuration in etcd. Who knows about etcd, by the way? Oh, a couple of people. Not, not you are expert, but you know what it is. And because I'm not expert, but I can tell you, etcd is a key value store that is distributed. It's the same one that is used by um, Kubernetes inside to store its configuration. And more than that, I don't know. Uh, it took me quite, a, quite some tries to make it work. Anyway, uh, so we have etcd. We have the Apache API 6 dashboard that allows, well, there is a GUI on top of API 6. I want to monitor the stuff, so I have added Prometheus and Grafana. And then I, I have my two services, the old API and the new API. Both run on different port. Probably for production, you should prevent a direct port access. But for this demo, it will be easier to do it like this. So here, eh, no, not yet. Never update during a demo. So here, I will Docker compose up the stuff. And regarding the code, so I know you are not Java developer. So I, who is interested in the code? Oh, OK, good. So I have the old API. This is, if you probably have heard, even if you have not used it, is, this is a Spring Boot application, so coding in Java. And because it's Spring Boot, there are a lot of annotation and stuff like this. So here, I can try to curl the stuff. Curl local host 8081. And I say hello. Wow, I'm really a good developer. And then I can perhaps pass some uh, like parameter. And because I don't know any typical Danish name, I will use my own. OK, so who hires me right now? And 
People who are in the Java world, they say, oh, Spring Boot, it's good, but we have so many annotations. And myself, uh, I'm more of like um, a Kotlin guy. So I taught myself Kotlin a couple of years ago, and I really, really love how it looks. And so you have this DSL. So instead of having annotations, you have like code. And so you can check at compile time whether it works or not. And here it looks super nice. And of course, we have the same stuff on a different port. Yeah. Yeah, obviously better, right? OK, so the idea is that now we are in this situation, and we want to use the API Gateway to help us. So we can like curl again, local host. So the port number is 9080, and we can say hello. And now it tells us, hey, what happens? I don't know you. Because we just installed the API Gateway, and so we must configure it to say, hey, this route should be forwarded to this upstream. So let's do it. And the good thing with Apache API 6 is that everything is actually a REST call away. Everything is on GitHub, so I don't want you to install anything. So here, I'm using Docker for everything. So that's why the reason why I have like this like, network evolved API default, because I like composed up one, net, one, one uh, architecture. If I want to use Docker using the same architecture, I need to use the same network. So I need to pass the network's name. Here, curl image. If you already have curl, you don't need to do anything of this. Then I have these route endpoints. I will be putting a new route. So here, I can set the ID directly. And here, because it's a, like it's a sensitive operation, you can break stuff, you can really do bad stuff, you need to be authenticated. Here, I'm using the API key. By the way, I'm using the default API key. Don't do that in production. Um, and now you define your route. So you can tell its name, you can tell methods, you can tell the URIs. Here, I define the upstream. That's why I use the name upstream. Basically, it's just a cluster of nodes. In this case, I have one single node because, again, it's a Hello World demo. But you can define a cluster of different nodes. You can like set which algorithm, algorithm you want. So here, run Robin, but again, completely useless with a weight of one. But we have multiple uh, like algorithm to balance between the different nodes. And here you, uh, I'm using the Prometheus plugin, so I can get like some metrics out of it. So now it has like passed, and if I curl again, amazing. That's really high engineering. What's a typical Danish name? Could you repeat, but slower and without the accents? Asmus, like this? Not like this, probably. With a? Ah, better. Like this? That's the only Erasmus that I know, so it will be like this. Works for you? Sorry, at my age, you are too far away. I cannot, cannot hear you correctly. And it's guessing because I have no reference. OK, let's, let's, let's use Erasmus for the rest of the talk. So this was my first step. And basically, I did do nothing. I mean, I didn't improve the situation. I didn't make it worse. I just enabled the rest. So the first real step is actually we want people to use a version a real version. Because right now, they are, we have a single one. We didn't think about versioning. And now we know that we will be migrating to a new version. And at some point, probably, people will use the v1, and our new clients will use the v2. So we, we mu must introduce this version. There are multiple ways to version an HTTP API. Here, I will be using the pause, because I mean it's the easiest one. Uh, but you can also use query parameters, you can use header, you can use, well, those are the three main options. So the idea, let's introduce some versioning.
What I did previously is I created the routes and the upstream and everything in one go. But probably we don't want to do that. We can create some abstractions to be reused. So I will create here the upstream first. And for that, we have another route called upstreams. What a surprise. Uh, we will still be putting it. So we set the ID here. And it does the exact same stuff, but now you've got a new abstraction. And by the way, this might be a good time to show you about the, uh, the dashboard. So if I remember well, yes. And now you can guess that the default login and password is admin admin. Again, not in production. And here we can see that the, the, the first route that I created you can configure it uh, here, or you can view the JSON that is stored. And well, you can see everything here. You can directly change the stuff, the direct uh, road. Yeah, why not? So it updates directly. And we can see the upstream that I created just before. OK, so the next step is we create the plugin configuration. Again, new route, put with ID 1. And the only thing that we add so far is the plugin is Prometheus. And now finally, what we can do is we can create the version route. And now we can reference the upstream and the plugin config that we did before. So this is very similar, but instead of creating one big blob of configuration, I create like abstractions that I can reuse across my routes or whatever. What I will be doing, too, is on the plugin config that I created uh, previously, I will add this proxy rewrite. The reason for this is now my call will start with v1. So it will be v1 slash hello. <laughs> the API getaway will like forward v1 slash hello to the upstream. The upstream doesn't know about v1 slash hello. It, does, it knows only about hello. So I need to somehow like remove the prefix, which is the case here. So I will, I will say, hey, if it starts with v1 slash something, just like forward to something. Let's do that. So normally on my gateway now, I should have two routes. One that is, do you see well in the back? Or because I'm afraid that if I make it a bit bigger, that it breaks the UI. Yeah, it breaks the UI. I'm sorry. Um, so here you have the, the, the first one that I already created. This is the one that I just created, v1 slash something. And still the upstream is here. Ah, sorry for that. Um, now I can curl it again. And it still works. So now I have two routes that point to the same upstream. The thing is, if I have two routes that point to the same upstream and developers being naturally lazy, they will probably use the one that has the less characters. Makes sense, right? Yeah, I do the same. So we don't want to uh, let the laziness of developers impair our migration. So what I want to do now is to tell people, dear folks, you should stop using the inversion route. And in order to do that, we fall back on HTTP, which has a nice status code for that, 301. So now the inversion route, we will update it so that, so the route here is the first one, and we patch it, and we patch it with the redirect plugin. So if we use this route, it will tell us 301, and in the location header, we will have v1, the URI. OK? So now I go here. And nope, doesn't work. Now you've got two kinds of clients. The first one of clients are very smart. And they will actually follow the redirection and it will work, but they won't know about it. So they will keep using the old route and be automatically redirected. The other kind of clients are also very smart. 
they are monitoring. Notice that there are two, two, only two kinds of clients, huh? the one that are very smart and the one that are very smart. So there is no other categories. Uh, and basically, in the header, they will notice that, hey, something is wrong. I have a 301 in the status. I have the new location. So they will probably need to update their client code to call the right one. The problem is we cannot communicate to the clients directly because we don't know them. Because we were so happy creating our API, we just left it to the world to use. And we were super happy when we saw our first request that were not, not the test one. Hey, we have a, a, like a normal customer. But unfortunately, after we got some traction, then it became a hindrance. We want to know who the people are. And at the moment, we don't know them. So the next step is actually to make people register. Who likes to register? Nobody wants to register. I don't want to give my email so you can pester me with your irrelevant marketing campaigns about some hot stuff and whatever. No, no, I don't want to spend 10 minutes with you to that you tell me about your super nice product. I don't care. I have a job to do. Nobody wants to register. But who wants free stuff? Of course. So. We need to find this like path to the human brain that say, hey, we give you free stuff, but if you register, you have like more free stuff. So this is, you can use our API, but it's severely limited. If you want to use it like above a certain threshold, then you need to register. For that, so so far we had we had like plugins for everything for that one, for this exact mm -hmm. use case. We don't have an out of a box plugin. I created my own plugin in Lua. Who here is a Lua developer? Good. So please don't be too harsh because that's the first time I read Lua stuff. What I did, however, I did like typical like developer stuff. I copy pasted from something that worked and I tried to web my logic in it. So basically, there is like one plugin that does like limitation of calls per period of time, and I added everything I, I wanted. So for the records here, you can define your schema. So what is like what properties are available for your plugin, whether they are required or optional. Then here we have these like uh, metadata about your plugin, the version, priority, whatever. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks for your feedback. I always forget that um, PowerPoint doesn't allow me. So here, so you have the schema, again, the, the parameters that your plugin will accept when uh, people configure it, some required ones. Then you've got the metadata, version, priority, uh, the name of the plugin, the schema itself. And then the rest is like copy pasted from the like the plugin. This is the main like this is the main function or method. I don't know how it's called in Lua. Function or method? I'm talking to the Lua developer. Okay, that's fine. So let's let's accept that it's function for the sake of this talk. I promise I will get better next year in Lua at least. Um, and then I've I've added this like block of code. Th what this block of code does is actually I will be getting the configuration for another plugin. So here I will be very simple. I will be using the key auth plugin. And I will check if inside this key auth plugin I find a consumer with this key. If I find a consumer with this key, I leave immediately. Otherwise, I apply the normal auth plugin, uh, the normal limit plugin, which means that I will be limited. To use it, I have this additional stuff. So here, again, I kept the initial plugin, so I have a lot of parameters. It tells me that if I call for more than twice in a 60-second like, time window, I will be limited. And I will give the 429 HTTP status, and the most important one is the message, saying, hey, please register at this dummy address. So let's run it. And this is the route. This is the plugin config number one. 
So here, if we get back now, I can go to V1. I will remove the V. Hop, hop, done. So now I'm limited. I need to register somehow. So let's register. And this is outside the scope of this talk. So I will be using, as I mentioned, the, the easiest like uh, authentication like possible, which is actually what we call a consumer. So we have a consumer's route. Uh, I will put it so I don't care about its ID. The username will be John Doe, but again, we don't care. That is the most important. We will be using the key auth plugin and the key will be named my key. So if at any point I pass an HTTP header with name API key and value my key, I will be authenticated as John Doe. Let's run it. The key, the, the key's name can be overridden, but because I'm lazy, I kept the same. And now I'm authenticated as John Doe, and then I kill, can call it like to my heart's content. Eh, unlimited, that's fine. That's pretty good. So now we probably should know a lot of our users. It's time to think about deploying the V2. Um, if I tell you deploy the V2 and I, I give you this step, probably you think about canary release. That's a good idea. But actually, we can do better. Before doing canary release, what you probably should do is to get like the same um, production workloads directed to our V2 and disregard the results but we can monitor the HTTP status and I don't know, the, uh, depending on your stack, the null pointer in Java or whatever, the same stuff is in C Sharp. And then we can compare them. So basically you will receive the same workload, you will send it to like the V1 and the V2 and you will monitor. If you have the same curves, that's a good thing. If you have like stuff that is completely uncorrelated, that's a bad thing. The reason for that is that who here does unit testing? Okay. Who here does integration testing? So oh, good. Who here tests in production? Yeah, I mean, everybody does testing in production at, at one point. So you need to be smart about it. So to decrease the risk, you send the workload to like the two versions and you check the differences in the response code and whatever. So here I will be doing the same and, oops, Myra traffic. And now I can show you the dashboard, the Prometheus dashboard. So it's 3000 if I remember well, Apache API 6. So this is the default API 6 dashboard that I copy pasted because again, I'm super lazy. And here I added two widgets. Again, big enough, I hope so. Can make perhaps a bit bigger, but uh, not by much. Um, so all the API that we've tested so far, so here we have all our codes, and here the V2, and we can rewrite it. So I can send it to, I will just do that because it will be easier. Tech, tech. I send a couple of requests and I hope that my curves will be the same. And I, I'm telling you there is, uh, it won't work. We have a bug at the moment. Um, so this is being um, handled, this is being fixed. But let's pretend that we have everything. So you should see your, like the new calls that I've just made here and calls that I've made here. The reason for that is that API 6 handles the plugin in priority order. And as I've shown you, the priority is backed in the plugin. So basically what happens is that first it like duplicates the load and then it applies the plugins that does like the removal of the V1. So the new API, uh, the, the old API received the stuff without the V1, but the, old, uh, the new API received the, stif, the stuff, the path with the V1 and hence it's a 404. It's being addressed. 
But you, st I mean, again, this is not a talk about Apache API 6, so this is the kind of stuff you should do. Like you should mirror the traffic first because there is no other test than production, but you don't want to uh, like take much of a risk. Once you have made sure that everything works as expected, and you're still a bit risk adverse, I am, then it's time for a real current release. So there are several strategies for that. You can say, hey, I will geolocate my users so only people in Denmark will receive the new, the new version. I will do that if I have a header so that only people who know about it can test the new version. Or you can do like run Robin, whatever, or whatever. Everything is possible. Uh, we support a lot of them. But for the purpose of this demo, I've just added the default like round robin. So basically, I have two upstreams. I've created a new upstream here, upstream number two. And what I'm doing is I will have give 50% of weight to my old upstream, 50% weight to my new upstream. So basically, I have a chance over two to get to the new, um, to the new node. Of course, in real life, you should probably start with 5% or like very low number, but yeah, it's a demo. If I give you 5%, I have to press 20 times, you won't be super happy. So I don't know if I run it already, so let's run it again. And here. Oh! So yeah, about 50% of the time, I've got the old upstream. 50% of the time, I've got the new upstream. At that point, you should increase the weight of the new upstream so that everything works as expected. Now I can finally create the V2 route. So I copy paste everything that I created for the V1 and I duplicate everything. So I have like V2 and I can do the same. And now finally, so now, I'm always on the V2. So I have a V1 that use canary release. At this point, I should probably remove the, um, like the, the, split, the, the split traffic, and, and now I have the V2. Now comes the real problem. Now I have two versions in parallel. And probably over time, I will have three, I will have four, and blah. Nobody likes to have all this stuff. So first, nobody wants to work on the V1. Probably as engineers, we want to work on the latest. And for an engineering manager, it's just like additional cost. So there is nothing in HTTP that allows you to deprecate endpoints, but there is an IETF draft that's called, hey, deprecate, deprecation header. It allows you to set a date or a Boolean. Here for the demo, I use the Boolean, but probably you should set a date meaning, hey, you will warn your user in advance when um, the endpoint will be deprecated. And then you have a link that points to the resource that people should use. Something that you can additionally add also is a sunset header, like deprecation is, hey, folks, you shouldn't use it, really? And sunset is, uh, it's gone. Again, it's a good idea to forewarn your, your, uh, your clients that you will be removing it. So here what I did is I only did the deprecation because I'm super lazy, but you can do the same. We can create, like change our header. So here you have one that is like static, static, but here you can reuse some of the uh, variables from like Nginx. So you don't need to write every endpoint by hand. So if we run it and we can try, so this is V1. And I need to set dash V to have verbose. And here you can see, here I have the link to the new version of the application, and this one is deprecated. Last step, enjoy. I hope that at this point, if you have handled all the steps that I have shown you, and business comes for the free, well, you will know everything. It will make your life much easier. Like, people would probably have registered by then, or like the bulk of your user will have a register. Meaning that if you need to change something that might be a breaking change, you might send them an email. 
because not knowing your clients is a real problem. Thanks for your attention. You can read my blog. You can follow me on Twitter if you're interested about the codes. Well, I really encourage you to use it. Um, it's on GitHub. So please open it, run it, play with it, break it. And if I got you interested in Apache API 6, well, you are happy to have a look. Apache project, everything is free, everything is open source, and forever. And now I think that uh, we have some time for question. And again, it's like Denmark, so... Yes, thank you very much. So sorry, I will come closer to you because as I mentioned, my earring is not what it used to be. So the question is whether uh, I thought about which user are using which version of the endpoint. And yeah, you, you can actually do that when, once people are authenticated. It's a no-brainer to just dump it into some logs or then Prometheus or whatever. And then you can like have like profiling. Yes, it's possible. I didn't do it, but it's possible. However, I assume that most people will do a one-time migration. And this is something you really, really wrong. They will use V1 and then V2 and probably never come back again. So people that are part of organization will probably like only upgrade and not downgrade. If they don't grade, yeah, there is something wrong, but probably you are aware of it already. Yes? How would you keep track of documentation per API if you're using several versions of an API and you're maintaining maybe different endpoints? You could have an endpoint that's V6 and an endpoint that's still V1. Would you, if you're using something like OpenAPI? Yeah, yeah, I, I would. I mean, depending on your stack, you probably should start with your OpenAPI definition file, then write your code. But here again, demo world, hello world demo, though not necessary. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you should have like real life documentation. So always start from the documentation and then generate the code and not the other way around. Yes? yes uh... Okay, I won't. No, it seems to be a tricky question. I, I know it already. So the question is whether to use .NET or Docker. I think it's irrelevant to the concept of API. It's relevant to how you want to like your tech stack to be. Do you want to stay on like bare metal with .NET? Do you want to allow yourself more flexibility at the cost of additional complexity? And that's a problem that only your organization can answer. I cannot answer it for you. Like uh, you need to have more input to say, eh, I think it's better to do this this way or this way. But like <laughs> in general, I cannot answer your question. I mean, do you have any pain points right now that could be solved with Docker or not? I understand your point, and my answer is I, I hate when people say this is good, this is bad. My experience as a consultant is in this context, the same solution can be good, in another context can be the worst ever. Uh, yeah, it looks a bit like hey, it depends, but actually it is. Um, so answering it depends is just a stupid answer, but it's only, normally it's the beginning of the conversation. So you can actually hire, or perhaps you already have somebody who can like take a step back. In general, to be honest, consultants are better because they, are, they come with a fresh eye. And then you can ask them this question, give them, I don't know, two weeks, and then, then they can answer the question. But I cannot without knowing any of the context, especially since .NET is not my like, tech stack by default. But even in Java, I, cannot, I can't understand. I mean, I can't answer that question in general, sorry. Sorry? It's, it's based on your pain points and in your like skill set. If you are, are all like Docker experts and you feel the pain point that could be solved by Docker, like, yeah, please go. If you need to train your troops and if you don't feel any pain points so far, then why? Because everybody does it? No, that's the worst thing possible. Don't do microservices because everybody does it. Probably 
don't do microservices because your organization cannot cope with microservices because you are not organized into Pizza's team. Yes? It sounds so nice with the API gateway and you can redirect all production load to both v1 and v2 and see if v2 behaves correctly. But a lot of APIs, the endpoint could actually change some state. So how do you cope with that? That's a good question. Here, you notice that I, I kept everything in one go. Like, I mean, it's a hello world, no state. Uh, I didn't change the semantics. Everything was fine. So depending on where you store the state or not, but it could be possible to have like a dummy database where basically you can store the state and discard it afterwards. You can have like, I don't know, in the Java world, we can use HSQLDB, which basically is an in-memory database. So after it restarts, you don't care. So you could read from the production database and write to another database. It's more effort, I completely agree, but depends again how much risk you, are, you want to cope with, like how much effort versus the risk. It's an engineering decision and it depends on your situation. Make sense to you? Yeah, makes sense. I'm just thinking that I could think of a lot of scenarios where it would be so impractical that it's maybe not worth it. But I guess that's exactly. what you're saying. So. Exactly. That at some point, it's, uh, it's going to cost that much, and the risk like, of stuff happening is like not huge, and the impact is low. Oh, then why do it? On the opposite side, if the risk is low, but the impact can be huge, then again, it's another, like risk management is an undervalued skill, in my opinion. Other questions? Yes. I'm not sure I understand your question. So uh, about about registering users? No, registering is something completely different. It's another system. We don't care. The idea is how to get to the registry of users. So here I've showed you like the simplest one, which basically you create one with one curl. Uh, but we integrate with uh, OIDC, we integrate with Keycloak, we integrate with many different identity providers. So basically, you can like read the stuff and know whether this person is loaded or not, if they are authenticated. I'm not sure I understood the question, so I hope I answered it right. But from your face, I'm not sure at all. OK, that's a no. That's a polite no. Um, <laughs> Come to me afterwards, and uh, because afterwards I need to like uh, catch my flight, but I have five minutes, and then we can discuss. Other questions? Yes. Do you have any uh, suggestions for a smooth transition from like like the couple of communication like microservices to uh, transferring to the new world without? I have another talk on what's called co chopping the monolith. Um, check my blog, it will be there. There is not, a, I mean, I, I have the talk, but it's not recorded yet, but you can check the article. I think it answers your question. Yes. So this uh, a little bit zooming, a little bit out, a, a little more typical question actually more in the sense that Okay. Yes. 
Uh, so let me pick up the question next week. Uh, do you know any like um, project screen? There is something like a patch compilation or something like that. Uh, it's also an open question if you need to do any technologies that. that, that so first, it depends on your tech stack a lot, okay. really, really a lot. Then I have been younger. I have been, I've been making mistakes. That the, the thing. And because I'm not too stupid, I learn from my mistakes. So when I was younger, we used soap. <laughs> and of course, as a developer, you wanted to write the code first and that the soap crap was developed for you. And the problem is it, it makes, it makes the, the, the soap like definition very tight to the language. Basically, we were using Java. It was not impossible, but much, much harder to call that outside of the Java ecosystem. So that's the reason why you shouldn't start in, sorry, why my, now my stance is you start from the contract first because you focus on what is the more important, which is like actually the contract and in a very agnostic way, and then you generate the skeleton for the code, and then you paste the codes that, I mean, that, that makes sense. But if you start with the tech stack and you want to generate the open API definition file, you're going to find out very soon that it was not the greatest idea. That's my lesson that I learned. Of course, you are welcome to like, try it and learn by yourself, which is very fine, believe me. Exactly. So that the thing about experience, some people might learn from the experience of others. My son doesn't, so he needs to like do his own mistakes. That's fine. But then he tells me, "Hey, you were right." Okay, okay. That it's the same concept. So either you are contract first or you are cut first. Contract first all the time for me, unless you have very, very good reason, which I didn't find yet. Yeah. You're welcome. Other questions? And thanks a lot. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>